Hello everyone and welcome. My name is James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise and tonight we're trying to answer the question, would Channel 4 be better if privatised? And I have to make two confessions here. One is I think I wrote the privatisation story of Channel 4 when I was reporting for the Financial Times in the late 90s on the major government. So these conversations do come around. But I should also say that one of the reasons we set up Tortoise, or at least I left the BBC and wanted to set up Tortoise, was that in the swirl of news, particularly in a newsroom like the BBC, where you're covering so many stories uh, a day, I found it was harder and harder to know what to think, particularly on these big questions and difficult choices. And I recognize that many people in the media come to the question of Channel 4's privatization with a good deal of skepticism, if not downright hostility. But clearly things are changing in the media world and it's worth trying to analyze whether or not Channel 4 would be better off in private hands, what that would mean financially and what that would mean to the landscape of the British media. And so I'm enormously grateful to uh, John Whittingdale, who is not only, as we said in the uh, introductory slides there, being a former minister in this area, but John for years, you know, sitting in the, you know, DCMS Select Committee, has really had to try and wrap his head around the changes in broadcasting and the broader digital landscape. We're joined to by Lord Grade, Michael Grade. Um, I tried, Michael, in my uh, weekly letter to sort of do something pithy about your career in the media, but there were too many <laughs> things that you'd run, so I just sort of blithely said had run most of British broadcasting at one time or another. So I, I, I hope that that, that, that that will work for your business card, but thank you, Michael, for joining us. Um, uh, I spent as a young media reporter at the FT a fair amount of time uh, rewriting Maggie Brown's copy that was, you know, sailing through The Guardian and then uh, popped up a couple of days later in the FT. So Maggie, it's very nice to see you again, uh, as well as, of course, all the stuff that you've written more broadly about the, the media, Channel 4 in particular, uh, has been a subject that you've devoted to, not just in coverage, but as a historian. So we're delighted to have you. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's rarely the case that you get to hear the voices of actors as an industry, but to have Paul Fleming from Equity, who's joined us, means that we uh, are going to hear about this, not just from audiences' point of view, but I hope from the people who make programmes and think about it from that point of view. If you've not been to a thinking before, I should just say one thing. It's basically like an open leader conference, an open news conference. We want to hear from as many people as possible. In this case, I think it'll be really useful to get to hear from John and Michael in the first instance, because I think in, as I say, in media circles, often the response to Channel 4 privatisation arguments is, no, here come the Tories, you know, what, what, are they, what are they thinking now? And we don't really get into the arguments. And so I think it would be most useful to start there. So, John, if you don't mind, can I just put it to you directly? You seem, as I as far as I understand it, to favour privatisation of Channel 4. Why? Um, well, I was in government. Um, what we were seeking to do was to look at how to sustain public service broadcasting in what is a highly disruptive environment uh, caused by the entry into the market of these extremely large, well-financed streaming services. Um, and actually, Michael Grade was, was one of those who sat on the panel set up to consider this. And it raises questions about the future of public service broadcasters generally, particular question around the BBC and how you pay for it, which you've seen uh, has resulted in the announcement this week about the debate around the future of the license fee. But for Channel 4, we were very concerned that while Channel 4 is thriving now, that over time, it will come under increased pressure. The model, which um, we were talking about actually just before the discussion started, is going to come under stress. Channel 4 has only one real source of revenue, which is advertising. Um, and its market share is un inevitably going to come under increasing pressure as more and more competition enters the market um, and doesn't have the resources to invest uh, and to um, continue to commission that content, which is going to be needed to uh, compete with them. And therefore, we felt that we should at least consider alternative ownership models, which would give Channel 4 
access to the investment needed in order for it to remain a, a strong player. And this is not about undermining or destroying Channel 4. It is actually about sustaining Channel 4 in a completely new environment. And John, and John you'll know, I mean, some people won't know this, but Ch Channel 4 is different, for example, from ITV in that it commissions programmes. It doesn't have its own studio. It doesn't make programmes and then doesn't have the benefit of the upside of that that production fee or IP. The one thing, John, I don't understand is that if the argument is really about improving the prospect for Channel 4, why is that not also on the table? Why is not giving Channel 4 the chance to make programmes as well as commission programmes part of the range of options that the government would consider? Well, I mean, I'm no longer the minister responsible, but as far as I was concerned, it is. Um, there were no options that we had sort of closed off before even opening the discussion. Now, I mean, I know that um, uh, particularly the independent production sector probably wouldn't exist today in the strength that it is without Channel 4. Um, and it is the fact that Channel 4 has acted uh, as the, the, the catalyst to uh, grow all those independent production companies. And one of the reasons that they uh, have done so is because they don't have an in-house facility. That in the terms of trade, which have ensured that the right remain or go back to the independent sector. Um, now, the result of that has been that we now have one or two independent production companies that are bigger than Channel 4. Um, and certainly the remit of Channel 4 is part of the discussion. Um, and I see no reason why necessarily we shouldn't consider whether or not um, the bar on Channel 4 owning its own production facility shouldn't um, be one of the things that is open for discussion, as indeed uh, of a nature of the terms of trade, whether or not you may retain the terms of trade or whether or not you restrict perhaps the term of trade to the smaller independent production companies, no, rather than all of them, but certainly there are one or two of the big ones which need no additional help now. Uh, and, and, and George, before I come to Michael, so let me understand the argument. The argument is Channel 4 over time is bound to see a reduction in its chief source of revenue, advertising. It can't find other sources of revenue because of the way in which it's structured. But then why does a private company, if it's continuing to operate the same business model, have a better chance of having or of building independent production, serving diverse audiences, doing the things that Channel 4 currently does? What, what, what does Channel 4 become once it's privately owned? Um, sustainable. I mean, Channel 4, actually, I would hope, will not look very different in terms of the content it uses than it does today. Certainly, I know part of the debate is about the remit. Um, I believe that the remit should remain. I think it can be dated. I think it can be tweaked a bit, but certainly Channel 4's remit continue to serve um, under provided for uh, audiences to be a bit more risky and edgy, and at the same time also to get out of London and to both in terms of where it commissions and makes programmes, but also of its own um, headquarters. I mean, all that would remain part of the remit. So I don't think, I think Channel 4 necessarily will look different, other than the fact that it will have access to investments which it can put into programmes. Um, and so I hope that the consequence was that you will have more money be spent in the independent sector outside London as a result. And I'd merely point at... For instance, um, what has happened in Channel 5, where I think few people would argue that Channel 5, under the ownership of Viacom, is a better channel than it was well, under its previous owners. So, so <coughs> yeah, that's an, that, that's an interesting comparison. We should come back to it. Let, let me ask Michael. Um, Michael, for those people, well, we've got the historian of Channel 4 here, but for those people who are even, you know, remotely acquainted with it, you were present at the creation Am I right in thinking you're now in favour of privatisation? Uh, very much so, yes. Uh, as, as always, I, yeah, I, I, I bow to John Whitty now, who talks more sense on these subjects than most, I would have to say. But why, Michael? Well, in answer to your question, uh, I, I think, you know, the remit has morphed into a brand. Channel 4 now has a very strong brand. 
And that brand has grown out of the remit. And the remit is very, is, is non descriptive, non prescriptive. It's for, catered for tastes and interests, not catered for elsewhere. But that is, Channel 4 is a very strong brand. If you're a buyer of Channel 4 and you pay whatever you pay, a billion pounds, whatever the number is, uh, you'd be destroying value by interfering and undoing the brand. Because that's the one, the hardest things to do in the media is to distinguish your service from all the other services. Now, the key to this uh, is whether the government, what the answer to the question that I'm going to pose, it comes from the government. Are they looking for the highest possible price or are they looking for the right buyer? Because if, 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 if another broadcaster buys, buys Channel 4, there's good synergies there and it'll, it'll work very well. If you sell it to a rapacious private equity house, they'll load it up with, with debt uh, and run it for cash. Uh, and the first thing that will come under pressure will be, will be the brand. So it's all about whether the government, the government wants the, the highest return, which is what the Treasury will be pushing for, or whether it wants the right buyer. And Michael, can you just explain something? What are you buying? Let's put ourselves in the shoes of a potential purchaser. What, what you're, buying, you're buying a, 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 a business with a, a successful track record, a very strong brand. You're buying a, a, a public service broadcaster with all the privileges that go with that, prominence on EPGs and special treatment and, and so on and so on. That's what you're buying. Um, you know, why did Viacom need Channel 5? They've made it work. And, and just to go back over that, so prominence on EPGs, the idea that you are kind of high up the pecking order on, an, you know, the electronic programming guide, it feels as though those days are of less and less significance because you might have a Netflix account or a Disney Plus account or a Amazon Prime account, you know, so... Why is that terrestrial broadcasting window? Well, if you if you if you re, if you abolish the uh, prominence rules, which is one of the benefits of being a designated a PSB, yes. you watch you watch the advertising rates plummet. What you can get for your airtime. So, so you're so just to understand, you're saying if you had a big broadcaster buy into Channel Four, they would be able to have certain synergies, I imagine, they're between them and this. When you're talking about that, are you talking about an ITV? And well, whoever, whoever. If, if a trade, let's call it a trade buyer rather yeah. than a broadcaster. They would have obvious, obvious synergies at the beginning, which would take costs out of it. Yes. Uh, but they would be, their objective will be to grow the business, and they'll grow the business by investing. They'll grow the business by doing what every free-to-air broadcaster does. In the in the in the uh, developed world is doing, which is to invest in content and own that content and distribute it and share properly in in, in a market negotiation on the value of the IP. Um, there's a there, there's a big upside to running this channel free of the straitjacket in which it, it, it presently is constrained. One last one one last point: Channel Four is too small. You know, it's yeah. a corner shop and. 10, 10 major supermarkets have opened around, you know, they're surrounded by 10 major supermarkets. How long is the corner shop going to survive? So, it's so, a corner shop now. So, 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 Michael, I understand like two, but not three parts of the argument. I understand the bit that says, let's get a, let's get a big media company in. They've got deeper pockets. They're going to be able to invest and grow. I also understand the bit that says, actually, if you're a program making media company and you have Channel 4, you've got a platform for your programs, which you can then go and sell around the world and make money from that. The, 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 bit, that I, the bit that I don't understand is none of that helps, it seems to me. That might help with a short-term battle. It doesn't feel like it helps with the war. By which I mean, what do you deal do about distribution, about big, the move online, the Netflixes and the Disney Pluses? You, that doesn't if help. You've got, if you've got distinctive content that is in character, essentially catering for British taste, British culture, uh, and things that viewers recognise and so on, uh, it will survive. And if it, if, if it can't make that work, then 
it doesn't deserve to survive. The key to it is its connection with British culture and the British people, uh, particularly the younger audiences, uh, which are so valuable to the advertisers. Uh, it, it could be sustained for a long time. So, but, um, let, let, me, let me bring Maggie Brown, if I might. Maggie, do, do you buy the burning platform argument that actually sooner or later Channel 4 is just not financially sustainable and it's going to need someone help to help finance it? Oh, hang on. We can't hear you, Maggie. One sec. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, there you are. Can you hear me now? Okay. okay. Um, I actually wanted to start in a slightly different place. Sure. And it is that um, I have spent a lot of time over the past 20 years looking back over Channel 4 and writing and researching and being, I hope, independent and writing a history with footnotes. And I have come to conclusions which are somewhat different from previous speakers, but um, I think they are very relevant. What I, th what I think about Channel 4 is that it is an immensely adaptable organization. Uh, that is in a way the brilliance of it. And we have actually in our discussion here, one of the people who adapted Channel 4, one of the many people, well, seven chief executives, somebody who was the longest chief executive, 10 years, number two. And uh, he actually, uh, it's one of the most key builders of Channel 4 in that he created uh, a very sustainable advertising department and a golden formula, which was uh, to target advertisers who wanted to reach young people and the wealthier, older people. And this golden formula, within a few years, 1996, um, resulted in a fantastic new headquarters now worth about 100 million pounds and he also fought off two proposals to privatize Channel 4, one under Margaret Thatcher and one under John Major and this um, process of renewal you can trace all the way through Channel 4's 40-year history and um, it's 40 years where the BBC is, is, is celebrating 100 years and I began to see this pattern, which is really quite important. You could say that in the 90s, okay, it was golden advertising time, but we had all of the launch of Sky and the challenge of multi-channel subscription television. And so it goes on. You find at every point, Channel 4 manages to adapt. And I think that this should not be discounted in, in the discussion today. The second thing about it, is that every um, chief executive, when they come in, um, isn't there for life and neither are the people around them. And it has a great sense of self-renewal. And this is all integral really to the character of Channel 4 that we're talking about now. I am not myself saying you should not have um, possibly a change in, 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 in the structure and the organization. I, I know that there are, are, are many faults at Channel 4, but there are two things at the moment which we really do have to consider. But Channel 4 at the moment, and it's been touched upon here, is obeying a um, agreement with uh, the previous Conservative administration under Theresa May to actually um, become a true, uh, to spread itself around the country, to relocate one of its headquarters, its national headquarters to Leeds, uh, and to put uh, commissioning teams with budgets in regional centres. Now, this uh, move to Leeds um, was clearly disrupted because of the problems we all have experienced with COVID and with um, a very sudden and frightening collapse in advertising briefly during 2020, but uh, it, it is still in progress. And this is a deal that was cut by the government. And Channel 4 has has, it's a very big challenge to reorganize yourself in this manner, and it, it hasn't actually completed it yet. So whatever happens, it does need to be allowed to, to finish what it is supposed to be doing. And, what, and I think this is one of the reasons why uh, there's been a lot of opposition, huge opposition really, to this proposal, this assumption uh, by uh, Johnson's government that, uh, that, that privatization was the preferred option because it's actually in the middle of doing something pretty radical and important. And it's also there, and I think Rishi Sunak may have a view about this, it's also there 
to support the, 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 the leveling up uh, moves that are going on across across the the, the, the political spectrum. And I, I, I think that this is a really, you shouldn't discount this because I think it really matters. And can I just make one further point? Yes. It has played a really important role in the creation of the uh, creative industry sector, which is booming. Mm -hmm. One very one point which people forget, uh, and I didn't know this until I, I started researching it. I asked the question for my most recent book, how many films has Channel 4 through Film 4 invested in and helped onto the screen? And the answer was 546. Wow. So it began for, okay, now this is, a, this is a really important point because we are now seeing studios being, uh, Michael Gray knows this more than anyone, um, in, a, in almost like a ring uh, around uh, London. And this, that, that, that figure only pertains to 2017, so I'm sure we could add a couple. Ma but Maggie, sorry, Maggie, for, Maggie, Maggie forgive, sorry, forgive me for uh, interrupting yeah. you. I, I, by the way, I see the point about film four, and actually I also see the point that, you know, Rishi Sunak might have around levelling up, you know, and the arguments that Channel 4, I've seen that Alex Mahon's made, which is, you know, we, we wouldn't be putting people into Leeds if we were a privately owned company. We put people into Leeds because we have requirements on us as a public service broadcaster. The, the, the one thing about... Would continue under private ownership. Pardon? Which would continue under private ownership. But John has. As I say, it is, they are coming to Leeds because that is the requirement of the government. Nobody is saying that if private channel is uh, in private ownership, all those requirements will be taken away. They will still be subject to regulatory requirements. But John, John, I, I think that that has been true for ITV, but it's really hard to say that Viacom, for example, has, has had any significant asks made of it on Channel 5. It's hard to see that Channel 4, if someone comes in and buys into it, is going to be answerable in the same way that the BBC and to a lesser extent ITV have been in terms of public service broadcasting. The requirements on them surely will be lighter. Well, I, I mean, it comes back to the point which Michael Grade made, which is, now, are we seeking to raise lots of money for the Treasury? Or are we seeking to sustain Channel 4 and for it to be able to continue to deliver in terms of uh, benefits right across the UK? I was always very clear. It was not about raising the maximum amount of money. It was doing what good for Channel 4. And the remit would remain in place and possibly even be stronger than it is today. But I don't understand the argument there, John, sorry, which is, on the one hand, you're saying we need to bring in a financial investor or a new owner of Channel 4 with some deep pockets that's going to make an investment, right? And at the same time, we want to have, because we don't think, as in its current configuration, it's sustainable, but at the same time, we're going to insist that the current configuration remains, in fact, that the requirements we put on it might become more onerous. Which financial investor, which media buyer is going to say, OK, well, I'm up for that? We have made it absolutely plain that the remit is going to remain and, and you know, could be tweaked a bit. But the interest that is being displayed in Channel 4 is, is, is right across the board. Um, I don't think there's going to be any lack of interest in buying it. Now, the government will have to decide whether or not actually we just, the, it is in the long-term interest of Channel 4. But the fact that Channel 4 is available potentially to a private owner while still having the remit um, has not proven to be any kind of disincentive at all. Well, um, John, I'm going to come back to you in a, in a second. And I, there are a whole bunch of people who've made comments about this. I'm going to uh, start bringing them in. But I just want to come to Paul, if I might. Paul, uh, uh, I've never actually had the chance to interview someone who's in charge of equity. And I've never had a chance to ask someone who speaks on behalf of the entire acting world. I can't think of anything more difficult in life. But, but have a go. It, overwhelmingly, I imagine that actors are against the idea of privatisation. Is that right? I, I, I think so, yeah, and, and, and I think that what an awful lot of the arguments around Channel 4 privatisation miss is a deeper question about what public service broadcasting means in the 21st century. That it, it is disconnected very often this conversation from the licence fee, from the rise of the financial burden of private subscription companies on ordinary household budgets. You know, are we seeking, what, what, what are we trying to do with public sector broadcasting. And one of the things that obviously I believe and our members believe quite strongly is that one of the core purposes of public sector broadcasting is to provide quality terms and conditions. Um, and 
it, it, there's, there's no good evidence to suggest that the privatisation of Channel 4 is going to advance that argument. Well, what does that mean? That means that uh, you can tell as many diverse stories as you like. If you haven't got a diverse workforce to tell them, you're not going to get very far. Um, and, and, and you know, none of these privatisation arguments particularly work in looking at that broader media landscape or suggesting that you're going to reinforce the things that we all should believe for the core purposes of uh, public sector broadcasting. And, and so, but, but what do you make of the argument in some ways that if you have a financially strong, you know, the sort of Michael Graves corner shop argument, that actually if you, if you were to see one of the big buyers, you know, and we, we, you saw in our slide some of the names that are there, whether it were a Sky or it was a... Viacom or it was an ITV, any of these companies come in and buy Channel 4, they've got, they've got more money to put into programming. They can make better, more interesting shows, shows that have a bigger reach internationally. That surely is good for the creative industries in the UK, isn't it? I mean, the, the, if you follow the argument through, yes. And of course, you know, people who are interested in buying it um, are connected to people who are interested in buying it would say that but it doesn't really run to a particularly rational argument. Channel 4 actually had its largest surplus last year. There's no suggestion that this burning platform is um, close anytime soon. And why on earth would a private company purchase it to put more money in? That's not how private companies operate. They buy things in order to maximize their profit. Um, however that is cut, however that is designed, that is the truth. So that, well, all they're gonna do is inherit this very healthy surplus, a very healthy advertising model that's working. Uh, and I think the, the, the big question we have to ask again within that big public sector broadcast question is what does this do to the diversity of media outlets we have in this country? We have ITV doing the thing that ITV does, that sort of semi-regulated but commercial thing. You've got the BBC doing what the BBC does. You've got Channel 5 doing what Channel 5 does. But the idea that ITV or Channel 5 would buy or Sky would buy Channel 4, and then suddenly do something radically different that's adding to that media landscape is, again, ludicrous, because why would you do that? The economies of scale or the approach of your business model isn't going to change. So actually, do we believe that having a regulated channel that is solely interested, not interested in turning a profit, solely interested in reinvesting in um, disproportionately British programming, which then gets a chance to be broadcast around the world, what, why would any private company do that. I mean, it's not suggested that they would do it from any of their behaviour with any of the other channels that they own. And indeed, they're going to look to make a return. So presumably, they're going to skim off some of the money from that advertising. So it's just a very odd set of arguments. It would be a set of arguments would be easier to understand if Channel 4's advertising revenue was going down. It would be a set of arguments easier to understand if it was part of a broader review of what public service broadcast means. But it's not. And, and I think there is something that it's kind of the unspoken thing. I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful to have a chance to talk about the impact of programming for our members and drama, but an awful lot of this, and indeed a lot of the conversation about the licence fee is motivated by um, certain members of parliament who throw their slippers at um, ITV or at the ITN news broadcast on Channel 4 or throw their slippers at uh, the BBC news and only want to talk about that content. Now, yeah. if that's yeah. the problem we want to fix, Let's fix that problem. Uh, I mean, I, like, you know, uh, uh, but, but, but actually a lot of this, when you start to stack up the economic arguments, unless you want to buy the channel, nobody's yeah. really making them. And by the way, I have to say, I'm, I'm only smiling, Paul, because I'm reminded of my time at the BBC, where you'll be glad to know you weren't the only person who'd say, could we fix the problem with news because it's driving us up the wall? <laughs> All the people in TV and entertainment were going, we're doing great here. They love us. <laughs> they love Strictly. <laughs> they love, you know, call the midwife. Why are you making our life so impossible? Yeah, on, I, on that, sorry, sorry, Paul, I'm just going to... So, I, mean, I, I, I think there's, there's one other thing to say as well, and, and, and I think this is important. We've talked about very traditional models of privatisation here. Yes. Um, and, and although, you know, we as a union are opposed to the privatisation channel, for, we think it's doing perfectly fine as it is. Mm. But why are we talking about a, a public service broadcasting that has a louder voice for its workforce and for its audiences? Why are we talking about a cooperatized model, a democratised model of how we run our public sector broadcasters? Why does it have to be handed over to a private company at all if you wish to run it in a different way? 
By the way, I, 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 suspect, I suspect, Paul, sorry to interrupt you, I suspect you're going to find you're going to get the opportunity for that, because if there is this debate about the licence fee and public service broadcasting, we're going to be into conversations about mutualisation and all of those things. But should we hold that for another time? Uh, I want to, I'm going to come in a moment to, I see Rod Henwood's here, he was on the board of Channel 4, I see Steve Barnett's here, uh, and I want to know what he thinks about news. I saw what Joanna O'Sullivan uh, was saying about what's made and what's good and Emma Jackson and about the balance of choices. So I'm going to come to all four. I'm just going to bring Michael back just to hear, because Michael, I think you had a response to something. I don't know whether it was Maggie or John said. So before I come to those four, just to you. Two very quick points. Firstly, in response to equities uh, contribution, uh, all businesses in the private sector are in the business to grow and they grow by investing. So the idea that people just make profits without investing is, 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 a, is a theory that uh, defies economics. The point about Channel 4 is that it's on borrowed time. All free-to-air advertiser-supported broadcasters throughout the world are managing decline. That's what they're doing. Channel 4 has done it very well so far. But make no mistake, they are managing decline. The hedge that other companies around the world, other broadcasters are able to employ is to invest in content, to own content, uh, and, 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 and create alternative revenues and to grow alternative. That's ITV strategy and has been for the last 10 years. They're doing very well at it. Channel 4 can't do that. Uh, it's just nonsense uh, that it can't because it hasn't got a chance to survive. And when it falls over, who's going to pick up the bill? Well, well, let's well, let, 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 let's let, let's some of those arguments. Rod Henwood, would, would you, you? You're in the perfect spot. You've worked in half a dozen of these companies, but but you also were deep in Channel Four. Do, do you agree the idea of privatisation as a as a horror, or do you think it is a good idea? I don't think it's a horror uh, at all. Um, I do think that, uh, but each side of the argument is a little bit absolutist. Uh, if you can be a little bit absolutist, a totally <laughs> absolutist, um, and 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 it and it's this. I think I think the argument that you um, uh, th that privatization you can have it and it's essentially cost free uh, and and that it's simply a change of, change of ownership, securing the future, but everything else can stay the same, which you could call if if you like the the Whittingdale argument. I don't think stands up. And I think even if you started off with a as good a remit entrenched in legislation as you possibly could have, what the imperative for a new owner would be, uh, would be to whittle it away uh, over time. And that's what happened. Uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, by the way, but, but that is what happened with ITV when consolidation was allowed, that essentially the strategy department of ITV spent at least half its time working out how to game the regulator in order to get the remit uh, whittled away. Uh, so, so I think, I think there's, you know, that, that, that's uh, one factor. The, the, the factor about borrowed time, I totally agree that in, you know, in the long run, we're all dead, the Michael Grade uh, argument. Uh, and, and I guess the question is um, really, given that privatization has consequences some of them negative at what point do you feel is the right time to do it and i know the 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 argument would go well it makes no sense for to have this entity in, in public ownership and the truth is if you started now you wouldn't start here but we are here and and uh my view right now is that there isn't a burning bridge i understand that you know one day there might be but I worked for Channel 4 when Andy Duncan was uh, chief executive. Um, not all that enjoyable, but uh, it was, <laughs> it was um, uh, the, the, the obsession that uh, permeated at that time was we're, we're going to die. We must get public support. That's all that um, I hope he's not here. He could ever talk about. Uh, and, 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 it, um, and it was founded on precisely the very good arguments that have been put about the future being bleak for a standalone free-to-air broadcaster, but it's still here. So I would just, uh, I'm not really coming to a conclusion, you'll be uh, um, uh, disappointed to hear. 
I, I, I wouldn't say that we'll therefore, you know, that, that this is the panacea here or here's the solution there. But I just I just would say that to say we're going to die, therefore we've got to radically change, move, emigrate is not um, is not a compelling argument. The compelling argument is around timing. Well, thank you. I'm just going to go to Steve Barnett, if I might. Um, Steve, many people will know if you if basically if you follow the media or you report the media, you end up sooner or later quoting Steve about the it, what's happening in the media. As a professor at uh, Westminster, you can see Michael's waving at you, Steve. So, 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 Steve, do, do, take take. The, I saw in the chat you made this point about news. Let's just hone in on that for a second, as regards what Rod was saying on remit. Surely John is right. You could say, look. Here's the thing, you can buy Channel 4, but there are certain things that are kind of absolutely sacrosanct. One of them is Channel 4 News. You could. Um, and more or less, as Rod was saying, within two to three years, whoever bought it would be saying, well, hang on a minute, we're paying twice as much as we're actually getting back in advertising revenue. We've got to peak our serious news bulletin between seven and eight at the very moment where even today with uh, streaming and, and online access uh, actually peak time still matters um, perhaps not as much as in michael's day when uh, scheduling was, a, was was an art but it still matters and at the very beginning of that peak time spot you're actually putting audiences off because people don't watch a serious news bulletin for one hour they actually quite like if you're going to maximize your audiences what they'd like is a bit of soap opera or a bit of comedy so it would not be long however whatever you want to write into that remit before your shareholders would be kicking up and saying wait a minute we could get a much better return in that hour for the uh, for what you're doing in that series and th th this is an important point because it's not just an hour of news, an hour of news between seven and eight. Uh, it's actually what Channel 4 have done, and I've done research on this, is they've managed to keep a serious agenda, uh, actually focusing in particular on foreign news, international news, for virtually the whole of their existence. They are, it is the only commercially funded broadcaster in the world that can actually boast that achievement. And I'm afraid, you know, John can write whatever remit he wants, but uh, essentially, as Rod said, within five years, a, an owner, a serious owner with shareholders would work out how to game that. And the same would go for whatever remit you wanted to impose. And I'm afraid, in my view, this is, this is actually a, a, a solution looking for a problem. And I take Rod's point that maybe further down the road, there might be an issue. And I say might, but th but I, I thought his point about no burning bridges was really important. Can I, um, uh, James, can I just make one further point, which is about the economic investment power of, of, of Channel 4? Um, there's the institutional culture issue, which is essentially a public service culture. No one's actually mentioned the term public service mm -hmm. in terms of C4 as an institution. But there's also the culture of investing in small and medium-sized independent producers. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a, a, a big company, a corporate owner, where do you go? You don't go to the untried small SMEs. You go to the big boys. You go to the big indies because they're the ones who produce for you. Yeah. And, and it's part of C4's culture that actually that they actually want to do what the conservative government wants to do, which is to help the, the, the economic activity in the nations and regions in, in, in those areas which are, are, are less privileged outside of London. And I think, we're, again, however much you want to ride into a remit that you've got to, you've, you've got a commission from small indies, in the end, that's going to be gamed and that would be lost. Steve, th thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to come in a moment, if I could, to, to Maggie on that. But can I just bring in Joanna Su uh, Sullivan? Uh, Joanna, you were making a point in the chat, fun enough, about the, the, the viewers' end of this, i.e., you know, how do you weigh 
success, audience success, and the delivery on the remit with, you know, new and innovative programming. Can you just sort of expand on that a little bit? I don't know whether you work in this area. Is this I'm your... Sure I should actually give you full disclosure. I'm head of policy at ITV, and right. I, pre I previously worked at BBC and Sky, but I'm actually here in a completely private capacity as a big fan of Tortoise and a member for a long time. Um, but no, so my point really was, there is this internal tension when you're looking at the business model of Channel 4 between um, the drive for po popular content, um, mainstream content to drive subscription, and the need to provide that niche and minority viewing that has made Channel 4 so famous. But I think there's a real elephant in the room here, which is that no one has really tackled the problem of what a PSB business model means in a digital world. And the reason is, is because the compact and the rules which set this out are now almost 20 years old. And uh, rules on things like prominence um, are, are all based on a channel linear lineup. Um, and when you've got Google and Amazon and other platforms mediating most of our consumption of, of content and siphoning off um, revenue share and advertising inventory, what is, is it really realistic for a public service broadcaster to be able to deliver those really difficult, minority, risky pieces of content? And I think um, it's something that I know, uh, you know, all broadcasters are struggling with. And um, I'd be interested to hear your views on how you kind of square that circle. I mean, what is going to be the promise that, frankly, the potential buyers of Channel 4 need to know? How do you quantify the value of a company by not actually understanding where its never reviews are going to come from? Jo Joanna, sorry, can I just press you on a couple of things? Firstly, I should just say, I remember arriving in my first, like, heroically long BBC board meeting <laughs> and thinking... <laughs> Among other things, I don't understand what anyone's talking about. So just so if, you, if you're not in this world, PSB, public service broadcaster, th those are the ones like BBC, like ITV, like Channel 4, like Channel 5, where they have to do certain things in order to have the right to broadcast. And those things involve kind of news. Historically, they involve kind of local broadcasting. There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff you've got to do. Let me just take the thing that you just said, because what you said is a massive thing, right? No one has quite figured out PSB's digital model, the, the model of those things, in uh, sorry, the business model in a digital world, right? So you're right in the thick of that. Presumably you're trying to figure out exactly the answer to that question for ITV. And you must be looking in Europe where you're seeing other terrestrial broadcasters, other TV broadcasters merging. It seems that like the number of broadcasters merging. What's your answer to your own question? What do you think actually is going to happen to TV channels as we know them? Well, I think you can't really look at TV channels in isolation. I mean, we are now audiovisual media service providers who are providing a, a lot of, a, 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 and a range of services. And we have to go where our customers are. So our customers are increasingly online and we need to be there for them providing services that, that reach their needs. And therefore you cannot, you, you cannot shy away from the conversation about what that means in terms of a mediated experience. You know, when I go on to my... LG TV that's got an uh, Android TV interface, will I be able to see Channel 4, ITV, BBC there in front of me? That is entirely down to right now the commercial arrangements that are made between those broadcasters and the platform operators. And there's no guarantee right now that, you know, Channel 4, I mean, the, the Android or Amazon could just decide, you know what, we just don't think that's an important service. So we're just going to push it off the front page. And that has happened. I think Channel 5 is now off the front homepage of I think LG TVs. So if you're Channel 4 and you are fighting for prominence, you're fighting for audiences, um, what will you do? You, you have a strong incentive to focus on mainstream content, driving that interest, doing the things that are going to ensure that you are getting um, tweets and likes and the things that drive engagement. It's not making really difficult niche content. I mean, one of the best things Channel 4 did this year was um, Lady Parts. I mean, the, one of the most brilliant pieces of comedy I've seen in years. I mean, I can't imagine the commissioning conversation that would have um, resulted from that when you have shareholders or you have commercial interests, or you think, well, how on earth is it going to rank? What are the hashtags we're going to put against it? And I think that's really the thing you may lose in this conversation unless you have a really strong conversation about that digital presence. But, but I just, Joanna, but just to be clear, it mm -hmm. feels to me as though, you know, Michael's point, which is Channel 4 is a corner shop, right? ITV might be even quite a big shop right, on the high street, a big high street shop, right? But we're in the age of the huge supermarkets. 
And even ITV doesn't have enough content really to compete with a Disney Plus subscription or a Netflix subscription or an heaven knows an Amazon Prime subscription. So I don't, I do see the point that Michael and John are making, which is change is coming. And in the current business model, these people aren't financially equipped to make the investments needed to either win or lose in that battle. It's a really difficult problem. And I think I think at the end of the day, it always has to come down to, do you value the content that's being made? And I mean, I can't speak to that. It's a very personal, very subjective decision. I mean, you know, I, I, I can say that, you know, there's a lot of support for Channel 4 um, in the public. I think, you know, there, there are also lots of other places providing content, but I do think there is a space here to recognize that, you know, there's a lot of people out there who can't afford Netflix subscriptions and, and other things. And do we have an obligation as a society? What do we want to provide as a society yeah. in terms of content that speaks to our u- unique British experience that you're not going to get from, from the Netflix or, or the YouTubes potentially? I, I completely get that. And actually, fun enough, I want to come back to John and, uh, and Michael about that point about, about Britishness and what happens, the risk to the idea of British culture with, with privatisation. But can I just come to Maggie first? And Maggie, can I come back to you? You on a, on a sort of, forgive me, I'm just going to come on a specific issue, which is one of the things that I'm really confused about, and I would really struggle with if I was working for Channel 4 now, is this. On the one hand, one of the most powerful arguments you've got is that you really help the independent sector. All the points that Paul was making about equity, but particularly independent TV production companies. But your best argument for actually staying independent and not being bought up by someone else is to be allowed to make programs yourself, not just be a commissioner, but be a producer as well, which itself, of course, would then marginalize some of those independent production companies. If you're Channel 4, which do you choose? Do you choose the, we only commission and we back independent production companies, or we commission, but we're now gonna make TV programs ourselves to get some financial firepower? Well, what I think is that there is a case for changing or adjusting the terms of trade agreement which um, in, in my last book, you'll see that the, uh, the grandees who, who agreed the um, 2004 uh, scheme, which allowed independents to own their, uh, own their IP, uh, they now say there should have been a sunset clause in that agreement. And if that was to be adjusted, it would allow Channel 4 to build up um, a form of um, insurance really through rights ownership and, and, and a bank of, of, of shared rights. And, I think that does need to be looked at. And I'm slightly with um, uh, John Whittingdale on this point, um, not so much with the smaller Indies. And, and it is a fact that Channel 4 does really work hard to encourage smaller independence. And in mm. fact, uh, its way of getting into that market is currently to invest in new and, and promising up and coming independents and perhaps commission from them to get them, give them a bit of a start. So I don't say, this is my whole point. I, 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 I agree with, with, with uh, Rob Henwood too, Rod Henwood too, that um, there was this ridiculous um, kind of wasted period under Andy Duncan when uh, there was this begging bowl culture, which seemed to say, you know, we're doomed, we're doomed, and it didn't happen. Of course, there has to be adjustment and change. And most certainly, I agree with Joanna, there has to be some sort of um, way of, of working out how you ensure that there's universal public service broadcasting. She makes very, very good points. And I actually think there are people in Channel 4, this is, this is exactly what they're trying to do and are working harder at, at that. When you, when you look at the way that they have adjusted with, with all four and with streaming and all the other things that are currently going on within the PSVs. So, I, I would say, I, I go back to my original point, don't rush this channel into some kind of future that is wrong for it. Um, mm. Treat it with a degree of, and the people who run it, with a degree of respect. It's about, I hope, to get a new chairman. That means my point about refreshment of bringing in new people to have a, 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 perhaps a, a different slant on things. I'm sure that that is going to happen. So yeah. leave it alone in a way, And but, but they're to. not stupid. And they, they know that these challenges are there and they are trying to address them in their own way, as well as trying to be this leveling up force throughout the creative industries, which 
I, I, that, that is underway right now. And you don't do that overnight. You, you will take a number of years in order to, to transition. That's what's going on at the moment. Well, let me, uh, um, Maggie, thank you. Uh, John, you, 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 you sat and um, listened to different thoughts and views on the Whittingdale argument. <laughs> do, you, do you see that the, the central point that Rod made, which is it can't be both things, it can't be kept the way it is, but also under new ownership, is the fundamental problem with the argument of privatisation? I, I mean, I think anybody who buys Channel 4 will be wanting to own the brand that is Channel 4. I think that Channel 4 still is and does have a very powerful appeal. Nobody's saying it's not successful now. Um, our concern is that it will require somebody who's willing to or has the capacity to put the money in to keep it riding that extremely um, successful content. Um, and so I don't, I don't see necessarily that a buyer, having bought Channel 4 as a brand, will immediately try and sort of buy, discover ways in which they can get around the obligations uh, and change the nature of Channel 4, because actually that's not why they would have bought Channel 4. Um, Channel 4 is still an attractive prospect. Uh, I think that prominence does still matter. I mean, Joanna's point about LG TV... Um, that is something which the government has already said we're going to address um, legislation to uh, extend the prominence requirements to smart TVs and other distribution platforms, uh, because I absolutely agree there is a threat. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, the, the prominence will become less important over time because yeah. people won't go to looking guides. You know, we, we've already now got TVs where you can just say, I want to watch It's a Sin, and you don't even have to think about which channel produced it. That is what will come up. Well, that's, um, that's, that, that's a big, I mean, that's a big argument. I remember in the world of news, do you remember this, John? Years ago, one of the arguments that was made about the change in news was that it was no longer going to be the brand or the masthead that mattered. It was going to be the article. And we seem to be moving in that world too, that it's the programme rather than the channel. So I, I see that, and I see that, and that, that speaks to financial resources in terms of marketing, I suppose. I'm, I'm aware of the time, so forgive me for cutting you off. I just want to make sure that we hear from Michael, my colleague, Matt, and Rod as well. So I'm going to do it this way around. Rod, you just had a quick point you wanted to make. Oh, sorry, we can't hear you. Yes, uh, very quickly. Uh, I, I think... Um, Corner shops get a bad name uh, on 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 um, on the um, the grade scenario. Uh, can, can I give uh, boutiques a good name? Uh, and 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 I think there's a virtue in niche, which in effect Channel Four is. Um, mm. And and I, I absolutely know that that future of niche is unstable, or the future of boutique is unstable. But be careful what you wish for. Be careful for, you know, Tesco takes over giraffe and actually uh, commoditizes it. Uh, so I think I think that's a very uh, important risk to be aware of. The last point is um, the combination of culture and nurturing of the independent sector, which is hugely important and has delivered real value to the British economy and ecosystem. And you, you unpick that under whatever ownership model at your peril. Well, thank you. Um, Paul, uh, is there a final thought you want to make? There you are. Sorry. Uh, there you are. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I'm back now, aren't I? Yeah, we're here. Yeah. And I mean, I, th I think... I mean, so, so somebody said that nobody spoke about uh, publicity broadcast. I mean, I think the, the core of my argument is about public sets broadcast. We're not talking about, we're trying to have a very, very sectional conversation about Channel 4 without talking about the role of, um, put, uh, the, the, the role of the state in regulating and engaging a 21st century media landscape. What you have is Channel 4 bubbling along quite successfully on all the metrics it's ever been set and a desire actually to privatise it for privatisation's sake. And we can talk about all oh, privatising and they invest in it. Has that been our experience as a country? Water, electricity, gas or the post service? I mean, I don't think it has, actually. The, the truth is, is that, you know, we've trained. It's, it's, the, it's the taxpayer that's had to, to, to come and back it up. 
And there's a big question as well. When we talk about, OK, there might be a point, not now, but in the future, where the money is needed. Why? There's been no consideration. Actually, maybe it is the taxpayer or the audience that has to pay that through a reformed form of licence, a reformed way of paying for public sector broadcast. You know, there is, a, or indeed, the cooperatization, the mutualization of public broadcast in that way, and, and maybe placing some more obligations uh, well, and more well, restrictions well, on the pay-per-view services. Paul, th thank you. I do think having a conversation about funding public sector broadcasting, aka the BBC, is probably a whole other discussion. When before we started, I said, you know, stick around for the second half. We'll do the BBC. Maybe not tonight. Um, uh, I'm going to go to Michael and then finally to my colleague Matt uh, to, to have the word. Last word, Michael. Let me put it to you that let's say that you've actually made the argument, landed the argument that says we've got a problem coming. Whether you think it's right now or it's coming down the track, you, you've landed that argument. What, you, what I'd say to you is that you haven't landed is a convincing argument that a private sector owner is going to answer those problems better. So can you explain why in the last moment you think that a big media company is going to do a better job of help of answering these problems that Channel 4 is currently? Well, let's look at ITV, which has got evil shareholders crawling all over it, <laughs> stopping them doing news at 10 in Coronation Street, where they which costs too much money, they could put a cheaper... I mean, it's just nonsense argument. Uh, shareholders are interested in creating value. We don't create value by asset stripping the business. So that's a complete non-starter. ITV is as British as it comes, uh, and it has major institutional shareholders, uh, and it keeps them happy, it keeps the viewers happy, and it keeps the advertisers happy. So that's a nonsense argument. The question about Britishness is what is the alternative? The alternative is disaster. Because you can't compete with Disney and Netflix and Amazon and Google and Apple and all the rest of them. The only chance you've got of surviving is to provide something that that market is not providing. And that includes a range of programs. Uh, all they do, uh, they're doing a few more documentaries now on, on the streaming services, but basically it's movies and, and drama series. There's no rain, there's no news, there's no live, there's no Strictly, there's no, they, they don't create anything. Uh, in outside of some fantastic drama and incidentally anybody who hasn't watched dope sick on disney yeah. plus you're it's missing amazing. one of the greatest television series ever 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 made i and want to by the way michael just just to let you know how contrary i am i wanted to have a sit thinking on are the sacklers really that bad right? <laughs> <laughs> when you've watched that program you're like really really um that's well i've just i've just been on uh 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 Oxycontin. I had a major spinal operation, and I was on Oxycontin. Then I watched the program. No, I think I might have resisted, but it is an amazing drug. But it needs to be controlled. That was they were dishing it out like smarties in America. Anyway, that's. The, I rest. Okay. I rest my no, case. We've got. We've I, got three. I, we've got, sorry, go on. I just rest my case on the fact that it, you you you, are, you either produce content uh, that uniquely appeals to. British cultural sensibilities, or you, or, or it's a road to ruin. So I, I wouldn't be worried at all about that fear. Well, Michael, thank you, Matt. What's your What's your view on this? Matt, Matt Dancona, as you know, is a editor and partner here at Tortoise, and also tries to navigate the politics of culture for us. So, Matt. Okay, well, uh, sorry, mindful of time. Um, uh, just very quickly, it's been an amazing discussion. Um, uh, but I think one of the things just to say briefly is the, the, this is a very specific subject with huge general implications. It's got to do with soft power. It's got to do with the paradox of uh, an age in which content is unbundled, but owners are getting bigger. Um, and it's also got to do with a very big debate, which is not new, but it's going to take a new form about public versus private. And I think the question in this is, can you really deliver what we mean by public service function in the case of Channel 4 with a wholly owned uh, by private structure, even with very strong regulation. I would say that that, you know, the evidence of recent history is not conspicuously in favor of a big yes. I think what value constitutes in Channel 4 is not necessarily what value constitutes in Netflix or ITV. So, um, I'm not yet persuaded. I, I'm persuaded it'll happen, but I, I think there are a lot of boxes yet to tick. Matt, thank you. I will, I'll say one final thought, which is 
a lot of the time when we get to a question like this, would privatization be good for Channel 4? I come away thinking, well, I started out unclear and I'm now even unclearer. Actually, I'm strangely on this one, actually much clearer. So a huge thank you to you in the sense that it seems to me clear that the arguments around the threats to Channel 4, not immediate, there is still kind of good runway here, but the long-term structural threats that, you know, everyone was talking about, but John and Michael, but also Rod and Joanna were talking about, these are, these are real. They're not immediate. I really buy Maggie's argument that there is a fundamental change going on in Channel 4. So the question is, how successful will that be? But I do do take away from this that actually it feels as though there are two big issues that need to be addressed. Wow. One is, as things stand, giving Channel 4 a, a decent chance at things, which is a change to its business model. So not necessarily privatization, but much more commercial. The more I think about it, the more I think being able to build a studio's business so that they have some IP, even those people in favor of privatization should be in favor of that because it would make it more valuable in the long run. And the second is, it feels to me as though, and the bit about the argument, Michael and John, that I'm least persuaded by is the, it has a strong brand and it will continue to serve that strong brand. The reality is, is the companies over time, their brands change. It feels as though this argument about the remit has to be had. And that last point, Michael, about, well, making sure there's a requirement to do UK-wide local programming, if you could tie that in, I think you might have you know, more confidence from the public that the things that are most valuable about Channel 4 would remain. And it's not at all clear to me that as yet, you've got those things. So a more commercial model and a, and a revisiting of the remit seems to me to be a sensible way to doing things as yet, for what it's worth, I don't think it's clear that privatization would be good for Channel 4, um, but let's say we're here to learn. I would also like to say thank you very much for teeing up future thinkings. Definitely, John and Michael, we're going to be asking you to come back to discuss uh, the BBC licence fee. Uh, and uh, at some point, uh, let's have a think in that just is sitting around reviewing Dope Sick. There's a lot to discuss in that TV show as well. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Paul. But thank you, everyone, for coming along uh, and helping us think this one through. Have a good evening, all. Thank you.